Welcome everybody. Today, this will be our first presentation in bioengineering with the Stingo seminar series. We're going to do this type of series in addition to our weekly seminar series. And in this series, we try to invite experts like from different institutions or internationally well organized speakers. And today we are able to invite Dr. Casanova, who is a worldwide expert in the field of autism. I started to work with Dr. Casanova since 2002. And I need to mention that working with Dr. Casanova, if you work with him, you will be very productive. You will love working with him. Since even after his switch to South Carolina, we still collaborate with him. And it is very difficult to, to introduce Dr. Casanova because if you look to his CV, it is more than 150 pages. So it is very difficult. If you look to the position that is half, it's more than 20 pages. So, so I just try to summarize a little bit about it. So right now, Dr. Casanova is in Doughty Chair, is a smart, a smart state in Doughty Chair in a School of Medicine at South Carolina. Before he joined uh, South Carolina University, he was in Doughty Chair at medical school here in the Department of Psychiatry. He is one of the founder, founding members of Autism Speak Foundation. And also Autism, he is one of the founders of Autism Tissue Program. He, right now, he is in the editorial board of 15 journals. He, during the last year, he received many, many honors. I just mentioned some of them he received, like some of them he received the Physician Recognition Award from American Medical Association, National Research Service Award from Public Health. He also st received a Stanley Scholar Award, Distinguished Faculty Award by Medical College of Georgia, and recently he got international award from China. If you just go to Google Scholar, you will find his citation index more than 13,000. And his H index is 53. So this is indicate like some little part of his CV. So I hope that we put, I mentioned the main feature of his CV. But if you go and Google his name, you will find his complete CV in the world. So welcome, Dr. Casanova. Thank you very much, Alan. <laughs> so I'm sort of a junior standing here. Uh, actually, I could have selected coming back and giving a lecture at the Health Sciences campus, but uh, one funny thing is that even though I work there, most of my collaborators were here. <laughs> and, uh, they were here in terms of uh, bioengineering or, or uh, electrical engineering or computer sciences. And, and so forth. And uh, I, I have to remind myself as I look at the audience that uh, the first project that I undertook while being here was uh, with Amir, and it was uh, an instrument grant trying to bring an MRI to uh, the university. And we finally got the grant, and, and the instrument is actually here. And it all started from the engineering perspective, and uh, then I started to work with. Uh, Abdel Magaribi, and we had several graduate students. Then I worked with uh, Ali Farag, and, and one day he actually called me because he wanted to introduce me to uh, a very good and outstanding student. Uh, he thought that maybe in the long term we would be collaborating a lot in between ourselves, and that happens to be I. <laughs> so I have known him, believe it or not, since he was a graduate student, and, and now he's one of the crisis stars within the bioengineering community and everybody knows him in other departments. Uh, I work with anthropology, I work with biology, so I, I am among friends. I am very well received here. Uh, the uh, lecture today will be a little bit of our research endeavors and I will be talking primarily about the work that I have done with uh, two individuals. Uh, one that I brought over here with me from the Medical College of Georgia, uh, Andy Sutala, and uh, 
Uh, this is something with a hair cut. It's an old hair cut was the day before. Okay? And uh, then I met El Bas. Okay? And, and this is just to tell you that we were able to actually construct a little story in regards to research right here at the University of Louisville that has acquired prominence actually nationally and, and internationally. Well, just to start the lecture, uh, you know, one of my old professors was uh, Raymond D. Adams. He was the newer professor of neuropathology and the chief of the road at the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital. He was a very well-known individual, and he was my hero in several different ways. Uh, uh, one of the ways that I actually tried to emulate him is that uh, we were talking one day, and he said that he didn't believe in drawing because it caused your brain to jiggle around, and he thought that it was tied to the dementia pugilistica, receiving too many blows. So he never exercised, and I followed his advice. <laughs> so he's my hero in that regard. Uh, the other thing is that practically every publication that I read while I was a resident in, in neurology uh, actually cited his name. He was that very well known. Okay, if you wanted to have a good publication, you actually had to cite him. And uh, he was an outstanding clinician. And one of the things that he said was that uh, neurology was very much like real estate. You know, it followed the same three cardinal rules, location, location, location. So if, if you wanted to start knowing about a condition like uh, autism, it was location, location, location. You had to localize it to see which organ of the human body you would have to study to make sense out of it. And uh, in terms of the uh, social abnormalities, language abnormalities, stereotypes, and so forth, uh, autism should be considered a condition of the brain. Okay, there should be no doubts in that regard. But there's one problem. Okay? Now, uh, imagine the following scenario, and uh, this we did many times in here at the University of Louisville, uh, and it has a very long tradition within uh, neuropathology and neurology. Uh, whenever a patient dies who has a neurological condition, we actually call for a conference at the autopsy suite, and we dissected the brain and the, the neurologist would actually defend his diagnosis and his localization and, and then the pathology will give us the, the uh, golden truth, okay, uh, whether he was right or wrong. And uh, you can do the same thing in regards to autism. Uh, you can actually bring somebody to the autopsy room who has died maybe from drowning a child who was autistic. You can actually talk about all of his or her symptomatology and then uh, you try to localize in your mind, make it a thought experiment where the uh, lesion is uh, uh, located. And uh, uh, you cut the brain into slabs and here you have coronal sections going like this in your brain. And the peculiar thing is that slide after slide they are all normal. Okay, there's no evidence of contusion or hemorrhages, there's no thinning of the cortex, there's no evidence of edema, and, and the ventricles look all right. But there's marked symptomatology, okay, in the patient. And, and there's a credo in terms of neurology and neuropathology. Okay, if you have severe symptomatology, you should have severe uh, neuropathology. And that's not the case in autism. Actually, for primarily almost any psychiatric condition, uh, there's no evidence of uh, pathology. And uh, if I had a resident besides me, and I asked him or her, well, where's the pathology? They would probably say, well, it, it's not there grossly. I cannot see it. So it must be there microscopically, okay, at higher resolution. And, you know, that's one of the problems in terms of the pathology of autism. And it's not that we have little pathology in autism under the microscope. We have too much pathology. And, and we have to discern what are the real findings from the non-real ones. 
Now, this is one of the most cited findings in terms of the pathology of autism. And, and it's of the secondary cells, the supporting cells of the brain that we call glia cells. People claim that they are in overabundance, that there's a gliotic reaction, okay? That there's an inflammatory reaction to the brain. And, and if you see at, at the evidence that they are presenting, you have to agree with them. Okay, if you actually do measles stain, counting the cells per se, you will see that uh, there is increased density. If, if you actually do immuno, okay, you will see that cells stand out, that they are really glial cells. If, if you do the immunofluorescence, uh, uh, you will actually see their abnormal shapes, and if you go to higher magnification, you will see that these glial cells actually look awful. They, they look nasty. Okay, here we have a binucleated cell, and it, it complies with the uh, uh, description criteria for a gemistocytic astrocyte, gemules, uh, meaning twins. So, so this will be a twin cell. And it has two nuclei because it's avidly dividing. It, it will soon divide and then you will be having two astrocytes and then you will be having four astrocytes and so forth. And if you quantitate the amount of protein inside of the cells, it's increased. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming that there is gliosis in the brains of autistic individuals. But, you know, there's this devil that sits on your shoulder and, and it tells you, well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a nice finding, but there's something very awkward about it. And uh, you see over there, there's an example of uh, inflammation in the toes of uh, the feet of a person. And whenever we talk about inflammation, the joints are like engorged, they are swollen, they are painful, they are red. And that's because uh, there's more blood coming to that region. The vessels are engorged and they are full with cells and they tend to be marginated and all of a sudden the vessels actually uh, sort of break their uh, junctions and, and then there's plasma seeping from inside of the vessels to the outside and it produces uh, a swollen joint. Nothing like that appears in the brains of autistic individuals. There's no swelling, there's no engorgement of vessels, uh, there's no margination of cells, there's no edema, but uh, uh, there's this gliotic reaction. You, you know, ha, what to make out of it? Well, it's interesting, but uh, I actually took on a survey of all of the uh, uh, specimens that were used from this study, uh, and uh, I analyzed them. And uh, basically, what I said is that if, if you took and analyzed the whole population of autistic individuals that they um, used, they, they weren't really normal deaths. They died because of something, and that something usually was a hypoxic event. You actually curtail uh, oxygen flow to their brains. Okay, it wasn't really a normal death. Uh, they died of a circulatory failure, sepsis, anoxic encephalopathy, acute respiratory distress. It, it seems like nobody died of a car accident, okay, in here, or, or maybe a natural death, or a myocardial infarction. And uh, this is the problem, okay, because we can explain the gliotic reaction and the so-called inflammatory reaction based on how the patients die. Uh, there's something called uh, ischemia reperfusion injury, okay? And with ischemia reperfusion, you have a stoppage of blood flow through the brain, and that causes uh, hypoxia, but then something happens, and that uh, circulation is reestablished, and, and you have oxygen-rich blood flowing through the previously hypoxic areas. And that procreates a radical cascade. These are very active chemical agents that actually chew on different membranes and they tear them apart and, and it creates a gliotic reaction. 
Normally, the glyphosate reaction is more prominent in the white matter because that's where most of the membranes are. And that's what was reported in the glyphosate reaction of autism. Okay? It's uh, interesting, but uh, of the series, and, and there may have been, I, I don't know, maybe 35 autistic patients, there were 11 drowning victims. Okay, you know what happens during drowning? First of all, autistic individuals are very prone to start swimming in one direction and they, they never turn back. So uh, that's uh, very dangerous. Okay, but then they drown. You rescue them. Okay, you take them to the shore. Then you give them CPR and you restore them to life. And then they survive for a period of time and then they finally die. What are you going to see in the brain? Is it autism? No, it's, it's the ischemia reperfusion injury. So uh, a lot of what we are seeing being described in terms of the pathology is, is actually reflective of how the patients die. But this is another study that is uh, quite famous and it came from the uh, University of San Diego. Uh, the group uh, from Eric Corchain and uh, they had some RNA markers and they claim that all through the cortex, these markers sort of uh, disappeared. And, and there were patches of this organization in the cortex that, according to him, indicated a developmental condition. Uh, well, one of my good friends, his name is Robert Hefner, he's a developmental neuropathologist, and he actually studies uh, brains of uh, children that have died and he said that he had seen this before and it was a really indicative of autism in any way. He said that the brain of your death is just sitting there stewing in its own juices and RNA is a highly unstable molecule that is easily degraded. An alternative explanation for the patients is that the missing molecular markers simply correspond to areas where RNA degraded more quickly. So he was saying that uh, this was really an artifact uh, produced by degradation of tissue. Is that the case? Well, again, I actually went to the uh, files that actually describe the patients that were used on the uh, previous report, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, uh, there was a notification from Catalina Betancourt uh, from uh, France. She's a very famous autism researcher. And she said, it was very disappointing to discover that the majority of the brain samples showed extensive degradation and that no meaningful conclusions could be drawn from the experiments. In essence, she had actually acquired the same samples that were reported in the New England Journal of Medicine and she had a PhD student doing like a uh, thesis on the subject and after several years investing on the uh, uh, project, uh, she discovered that the tissue was degraded and it couldn't be used. And uh, she concludes uh, several research groups received the same brain samples that we got them because they did not perform brain sections they did not realize the problem with the tissue quality and went on to publish their findings. And uh, this was actually a couple of years before the New England Journal of Medicine article was published. And it was there in the records of the patients, okay, that they couldn't use it for this particular purpose. So some results are actually due to uh, artifacts related to agonal and pre-agonal conditions, others uh, may be variously attributed to the way the brain and tissue was collected, stored, and, and probably degraded. Uh, but still, we really didn't have any major replicated findings in, in autism. And uh, this is one point in uh, uh, your own career where you have to stand back and, and actually see the field in, in a very broad perspective because you will see that many people are, are just striking their heads against the wall, banging against the hole and, and, and not getting anywhere. What is happening, and, and it's not really autism, it may be schizophrenia, 
bipolar uh, disorders, dyslexia, attention deficit, hyperactivity, where, not where, in regards to neuropathology. And then it sort of uh, reminded me of uh, uh, a particular author, Thomas S. Kuhl, who was a philosopher of science, and he wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and he said that science advances by obtaining a different perspective on an old problem. He called it a paradigmatic shift. And what I understood in terms of my own particular perspective of the neuropathology of autism is that uh, we were dealing with an old preconception that uh, many neuropathologists were um, neuronal chauvinists. They placed the neuron at, their, at the center of their diagnostic universe. Uh, you know who Ptolemy was? He, he actually placed the uh, uh, Earth at the center of the universe. Okay, and, and those are neuropathologists. They believe that the neuron is God. Okay, and in order to have pathology, neurons need to be shrunken or they need to be reduced in number. Uh, and, and if you do not find it there, then you do not have pathology. And uh, this is really an example of classical neuropathology. And uh, these are ischemic changes. And uh, you see pyramidal cells. The PL surface will be all the way over there. And you see the neurons that are shrunken. And, and the cytoplasm is homogenized. The same thing with the nuclei. And, and it all stays pinkish. I, I mean, this is pathology. Nobody would deny it. But what happens if the level of resolution escapes this? cellular pathology. What happens if instead of looking at cells and different components within a hierarchical system, the pathology is in how they are constructed together in terms of connectivity. Okay? So instead of looking at single neurons, I decided to look at another level of organization of how neurons constitute themselves together into information processing units. And I studied over at Johns Hopkins, and one of my great mentors there, one, one of my heroes <coughs> that died recently, a couple of years ago, was Vernon B. Uh, Vernon Benjamin Mountcastle. And uh, uh, it's sort of funny, but many people do not know that he was from Kentucky. Okay, and, and I actually asked him once, you know, you, you are like a prototype Northeasterner, okay? Everybody considers you like being the Hopkins type. And they do not know that you are from Kentucky. Why don't they know that? And he said, if they knew that I would be, that I am from Kentucky, they would all be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so he liked riding horses, he, he liked playing tennis, he, he was quite an individual. And uh, his major claim to fame uh, I, I would say, uh, as on a tangent, is that he was robbed of a Nobel Prize. And uh, practically the people that took his techniques, who took his equipment, who took even his uh, uh, laboratory tech, uh, uh, Thurston and Whistle, they actually won for the same discovery <laughs> that he had promoted and nobody believed in him. He actually described columns of tissue uh, within the uh, cerebral cortex, that if you impale them with a microelectrode, sort of like putting a candle on a cake, if you went perpendicular to the surface, every single neuron, they have the same properties. If you stimulated one cell, they all reacted in unison. Uh, they were acting as a unit. And because they were a unit of function, he decided to give it a name, and he called them mini columns. Okay, mini because they are microscopic, columnar because they have a vertical arrangement. And he said that from here and this unit, you have all of the emergent properties of the brain. Uh, you have a theory of mind, you have a, a high end cognitive functions, and so forth. So instead of uh, studying uh, cells individually, I decided to study uh, mini columns. And uh, they were very well known uh, in, in terms of different attempts at parcelating the brain. 
okay, including those of Grogman. Uh, this is a study that I did with um, Andy Switalo. And uh, what we took here was a very convoluted area of the brain. It's, it's a gyri. And uh, we use a Fourier expansion series. And uh, the second harmonic actually gives you the longitudinal axis of the cells, of pyramidal cells. So we could use them to indicate atoms within like a, a given pixel that would indicate the orientation of uh, pyramidal cells. And uh, you can see here how despite the convolution, there's a general insistence that pyramidal cells should actually maintain a certain orientation. And that is simply because if you actually miss on this mini columnarity, you actually miss on why the brain is the brain. Okay, you would get no information processing. This is a primary architectural motif to the brain. And uh, we developed several different methods for actually uh, measuring mini columns, and, and there were many different problems uh, with this. Uh, one of them is that mini columns actually do not transverse the length of the cortex, but they wiggle their way up and down the cortex. So you usually have to examine patches of mini columns rather than whole mini columns. Okay, so again, and they have to develop different uh, techniques and different defining criteria to actually provide for a description of mini columns in the different layers of the uh, cortex. And when we used it in autism, we actually found a very clear difference in between autistic individuals and uh, normal or neurotypical individuals. And we published that in uh, the journal Neurology, the Green Journal of Neurology. At the same time that we published this, we had already reproduced our findings using another technique, which is called the gray level method. Okay, it's, it's a technique that was used by Carl Seelis and was approved by the World Health Organization as a way of semi-automatically parcelating the brain. And in here you have a pseudo three-dimensional representation of the mini columns uh, using the GLI, and in here you have a, a pseudo-colorized version of the missile stain slide. And you can see how those mini columns sort of zigzag their way in and out a particular axis of the uh, tissue. And you could actually uh, use your skills in terms of engineering and bioengineering and, and apply algorithms and then measuring different aspects of those mini columns. Okay, and, and when you did that, you could see a clear separation in between autistics and the normal control individuals. So we actually reproduce our original findings. Mini columns are very different in autistic individuals than controls, and that's primarily because they are smaller. Okay? There is one other study that actually has found bigger mini columns, but they fall within a continuum uh, in terms of age. When, when you take age into account, you can see why that is the case, and maybe I will explain that in the end. And uh, then we actually went through many different conditions and, and we found that that mini columnarity defect or pathology uh, accrued to autism and autism only. Okay, it wasn't there in Fred syndrome, it wasn't there in schizophrenia, it wasn't there in Down syndrome. Uh, the only place where we found it was in Asperger's. And the difference was in terms of severity, not in terms of kind. So Asperger's was a simpler and milder form of autism. And ever since we described this in the literature, now Asperger is known to fall under a continuum and according to the DSM-5, okay, there's no division. Asperger's fall under the autism classification. We further parcelated the mini columns into uh, different compartments. Uh, usually there's a central core compartment where you see the pyramidal cells. 
and uh, it's primarily excitatory. Uh, that's, that's a compartment that uh, modulates all of the information processing and, and gives you like, uh, you get the stimuli and then you get a response. But in the periphery, you get a lot of inhibitory cells that project to the inside core, okay, and, and, and it's sort of, uh, uh, it's a break on a runaway excitation. Okay, if you didn't have this compartment here, you would have a completely excitatory compartment uh, that would produce only seizures. It would only produce a constant firing regardless of the type of stimulation that you receive. And uh, what we found was that this compartment in the middle, in autism, is normal. That the whole column is actually shrunken but it's actually due to this peripheral compartment. So there's something in terms of the inhibitory element of the cerebral cortex that is at fault in autism. Okay, it's not in the excitatory portion, it's in the inhibitory portion. Well, a long time ago, there was a very famous uh, uh, neuroanatomist uh, from uh, Yugoslavia, uh, his name was uh, Janos Sesengotai, and he had uh, described the mini uh aspects of the cerebral cortex, and he said, well, you have a cylinder, and in here you see the transparent cells that are, they are all excitatory, and in the periphery, you see all of these inhibitory cells, in here darker cells, okay, and he said, you know, this inhibition at the periphery of the cell mini column is like a shower curtain of inhibition. And, and that analogy sort of stuck to me, because you notice that that shower curtain is abnormal, okay? You know that a shower curtain actually keeps water inside of the bathtub? Okay, whenever you don't have that shower curtain, water is going to splash outside. And the same thing actually happens in autism. This shower curtain is abnormal. Water is no longer kept into the bathtub. It actually splashes outside. So information is no longer kept in the mini column but it's able to suffuse, to diffuse into the outside, into adjacent mini columns. And now you not have information confined to one mini column, but it sort of spreads into adjacent mini columns. What is the importance of this? <coughs> well, th this is a way of trying to understand this a, a little bit uh, more simply. Usually, neurons actually respond to a particular stimuli. It may be a slanted line, it may be a square. In here, there's a neuron that recognizes a particular shape, and that would be a square wave, okay? A very fast rise time, a very fast downtime. You have a square wave, the neuron fires, and it recognizes the square wave because it fires more in terms of frequency. It increases its frequency of firing. So this is a square here, this is a square here. Whenever you have pathology, the neuron fires when, he, when, when it actually sees the square, but it also fires outside of the square. So it's very difficult to actually recognize noise from signal. Okay, and it causes a lot of confusion, and, and obviously you cannot process information adequately and uh, this will be translated into seizures and maybe into intellectual dysfunction and, and so forth. I, actually, if you want to know more about this, you can also ask Andy because uh, he did some computer modeling of uh, this phenomenon and he had preparated uh, them to two different types of waves in three dimensions. One being a Mexican hat sombrero, which was normal, and then there was another one, a top hat, which was the autistic individual. And what he said in the end was that uh, normally we process information in an analog way where you have many different uh, points of measurements, many different variables being taken into account. 
when you transform the brain into the autistic one, you are transferring to a digital mode, the top hat, and you only have two levels of the information, a zero or a one. Either you are at rest or you are by video. And uh, from there on, we actually developed a model about autism, what is happening, and uh, we said that, uh, you know, the cortex is actually formed from two main streams of migration. One of them actually happens from cells surrounding the ventricles, and you can see there how they migrate gradually to the cerebral cortex, and those will be pyramidal cells, they are going to be excitatory cells, and then there's another stream of migration coming from um, the ganglion eminences, which are going to be the basal ganglia. They are inhibitory cells and they migrate tangentially through the uh, cerebral cortex. And when they come together, the pyramidal cells and the inhibitory cells, they work in unison. They, they work as functional units. We call them dyads. And in autism, those dyads really don't come together. So there's something that actually happens during brain development that causes these cells to actually migrate towards the cortex, but they do not catch up with the migration of the tangential cells. Okay, there is a major abnormality. And uh, we have a good deal of experience to say that autism is a migrational abnormality about 85% of individuals actually have evidence, have a tombstone in their brain that this is actually the case. And uh, this, for example, if, if we actually examine MRIs, this is an island of cells that started moving towards the cortex and it never arrived there. Okay, so it was trying to migrate and it stopped within the white matter. Now the problem with that is that if, if you actually examine this at uh, uh, higher magnification over there, you will see that the cells that are here are usually big, they have big nuclei, big nucleoli, they are excitatory cells. Okay, they, they were the component that was surrounding the ventricles and would be developing into excitatory cells in the cortex, and they never arrived there. But if you get all sort of excitation within a nodule and you do not have any inhibition, what do you get? Okay, you, you get somebody with seizures. Okay, and the correlate of this is relentless recalcitrant seizures, as seen in many autistic individuals. So we have collected a lot of data from immunopathology to actually back us up, and, and uh, it happens all over the brain. This will be the cerebral hemispheres, this will be the cerebellum. Uh, we have done this in terms of MRIs, we have done this in terms of neuropathology, and, and there are other groups that actually are in agreement with us. So we have a basic concept of uh, what is happening in the brain in autism, but you know, findings and ideas are cheap. They are a dime a dozen. If you cannot do anything for the patients, okay, then your idea is really not worthwhile. So how can we apply our findings in regards to treatment? Well, in here, you actually see what is happening in the brain uh, in regards to mini columns. And uh, you can see the central core of pyramidal cells and how the inhibitory component is actually at fault. Okay? Those fibers that provide the inhibitory component are primarily vertical and crisscross the uh, uh, cerebral cortex. There's a law in, in terms of physics, and okay, it's called the law of paradigm, that it actually states that if, if you impose a battery magnetic field on a conductor, it, it will propitiate, uh, it will induce a current through the same. And that's primarily if the inductor stands at 90 degrees to the uh, magnetic field. Well, it, it just so happens that if this was the cerebral cortex, all of the inhibitory fibers are going down straight. If we were to put a lot of magnetic field here, 
we would be actually in this encoder to the elements that appear to be at fault in autism. Okay, and it would be very selective. So we started doing that in autistic patients uh, using a technique called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I'm happy to say that uh, we have had 14 trials, we have treated over 200 patients. Uh, we had a major expose in Newsweek and it went international uh, while we were here in, in, uh, at the University of uh, Louisville. And now we have even part of an HBO special uh, coming on the subject and, and it's the basis for a best-selling book uh, by John Elder Robinson called Switched On. So we have a uh, kid here who's participating in one of the trials and uh, these are some of the results of the same. You know, autism is something very peculiar in, in terms of how they react, how, uh, how they answer questions, how, how they behave socially. One of the most famous autistic individuals is Dr. Temple Grandin. She wrote a book called The Unwritten Rules of Social Relationships. Okay, and in that book she actually wrote the Ten Commandments for social discourse, for social interaction. And she said, whenever I am in a social situation, I guide myself by rules. You know, before I answer somebody, I have to see if it complies with this, that, and so forth. So she's not acting reflexively. She's actually first thinking with her prefrontal cortex. And in this particular study, we actually were stimulating under different circumstances uh, an autistic individual. Actually, we had a, a whole group of autistic individuals, and these were like the average. And uh, we saw that regardless of the type of stimuli, you know the red hot iron scale, red meaning like most active, it's primarily always on the <coughs> prefrontal cortex. And we saw that after providing for RTMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, that actually migrated and they started reacting more reflexively. So if, if it was a visual stimuli, like this particular test, the first area to be stimulated would be the visual cortex. So that was actually markedly positive. Uh, this is in terms of gamma, and this is another curious thing that uh, happens in autism. In uh, autism, an individual will actually try to provide a construct of your face, but there's too much information there. It's, it's like looking at the sun. So instead of looking at the whole face, they actually take a sliver of information in and they will remember your face based on the glasses that you were wearing on your nose or your lips, but not the gestalt. They see the tree, but they lose the forest. And the way that perceptions are actually built in normal individuals is by putting the different areas of the brain that are acting individually on a particular precept putting color, with symmetry, with any emotional connotations all together in, in, into what may be your face or what may be a table, okay? And in autism, that's really at fault. So we were one of the first individuals to actually uh, study gamma in uh, autism. And this was actually due to the collaboration of Ivan El Bass because he was the one who was actually abstracting the gamma frequencies from all of the uh, EEG uh, uh, recordings. And in here you have gamma for our control under different uh, type of stimuli. You, you see a marked difference. In autism, it really doesn't matter what type of stimuli you're presenting. It may be a house and a face, and they will value the same equally. It may be a face upright and a face downright. They will value the same equally, okay? But just remember this, printing and mass, they are equal, okay? So this was the previous bar graph, pre-TMS, and this is the post-TMS, okay? There are marked differences. They begin to make sense out of the world. 
And uh, this was another story. It's a grand average. I think that this was uh, particularly like for 12 patients. And, and it's in the sense that uh, originally, when you study the coherence of different regions of the brain uh, using EEG, uh, they have primarily short correlations, uh, short projections, and they have very little in terms of long projections, especially with homologous areas of the brain. But as you give RDMS, okay, that long connectivity increases substantially. So both brains now are working at in unison. Both brains, both brain hemispheres, are coordinating their thought patterns and so forth. And uh, right now what we are doing is that uh, we're combining our um, results of our DMS with little feedback to actually enhance the results of the gamma uh, findings and, and uh, thus far we have a couple of publications and there appears to be a lot of synergism. And uh, I, I will go very fast through this, but uh, another area that we have been very interested in is in terms of uh, diagnosis. And uh, what happens during evolution is, is that the brain has increased in size, it's called encephalization but also the structure and morphology of the brain has um, uh, changed uh, peripassal uh, during brain development. Brains get bigger, but they get to be more complicated, complex in terms of their convolutional pattern. And they actually change their connectivity uh, from uh, one that actually emphasizes joint connections to one that emphasizes more of a small world map type of connectivity. And we say, well, if, if this is the case, you know, that there are many uh, anthropometric indices that uh, are indicative of connectivity that we could use for the diagnosis of uh, autism. And uh, that was primarily based on the intuition that there was a bias in terms of connectivity that structurally emphasized short connections at the expense of uh, longer ones. And uh, we thought that this could be a major influence over present gold standards of a diagnosis that relied on behavior for many different uh, reasons. Uh, primarily, we could probably anticipate a diagnosis based on behavior. And the good thing about that is that uh, usually diagnosis based on uh, DSM-5 or DSM-4 adults uh, are, are usually given at four years of age, at five years of age. With this, we could actually make a diagnosis like at six months of age. And, and the patient wouldn't be presenting any symptomatology whatsoever. Uh, the idea being that the earlier the diagnosis, the earlier you could provide for an intervention and the better the prognosis, okay? because you would be preventing changes from becoming hardwired. And uh, we took uh, three different indices of connectivity, one being the corpus callosum that connects, that collects all of the long projections in between the hemispheres. Another one was uh, cortical complexity, and another one was the gyra window, which is that uh, small space at the base of the gyra that allows for fibers to go out and in of the cerebral cortex. So we actually develop a way of uh, measuring uh, a cortical complexity again. It was uh, uh, based on uh, spherical harmonics and uh, we found that um, uh, patients with autism the spherical complexity was a lot higher. Uh, the number of, of uh, variables that you needed to select in order to implicate an endpoint, a finality, in terms of the reconstruction of the brain, uh, was a lot higher in autistic individuals as compared to controls. And then when we added other conditions like dyslexia, uh, we actually have a similar finding but it reversed, 180 degrees opposite. It was less complicated, less complex, and both are related to connectivity. 
I, I must say that we were fairly definite in terms of those findings because uh, we really had a very large control database. And uh, this was the largest MRI database that was available at that time. And, and we did over 500 patients where we actually applied this technique and we followed the patients like from four years of age to about 22. And the series is still continuing. And uh, we did the same thing with the gyral window, and uh, we proved that there were marked differences in between the autistics and the normals, and we did the same thing with the corpus callosum. Uh, uh, we also had a um, database of high-risk individuals to see how early we could provide for a diagnosis, and uh, we can be fairly certain of a diagnosis as uh, young as uh, six months of age. But I, I have gone very fast through the last few slides, but I know that I'm running short of time, and, and I really wanted to open the discussion and answer any questions that you may have. So I, I would say that's the last slide. Thank you very much for listening and for your patience. Could you go back to the thing you were just showing with the cortical complexity? Um, you showed the 